So every few weeks I get a couple of questions online from Arizona MMA fans asking me, when will the UFC finally make its debut in the great state of Arizona? Until recently, I didn't have an answer. But after celebrating its 21st birthday last month and recently putting on its 300th event, the UFC has finally decided to put an event here in Arizona. On Saturday night, UFC on Fox 13 will take place at the U.S. Airway Center home to the Phoenix Suns. For the very first time, the UFC has come to the Valley, and I know one man who is very excited about that. It's our very own Sean Alshadi, who is from Arizona. And by the way, hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani outside the arena here that will host UFC on Fox 13. Great to be here in Phoenix. So, Sean, am I correct in thinking that you are ecstatic about the UFC making its debut in your hometown on Saturday night. I mean, I can't complain. We just did uh we were just in the Suns practice court doing the media day stuff. It's pretty cool. It takes me back to my internship days. And what about the crowd here, the fan base here, the anticipation? I mean, I would get questions all the time and the answer that the UFC would usually give is it's so close to Las Vegas, you That's could probably the make the trip. Are you sensing that they're they're, they're super excited for this that they're going to come out and support and show that they deserve to have events here? Um, you know, I don't know. It's hard to get a read on it. The, the open workouts, we, we got like 200 people there. It was a decent sized crowd for open workouts. But you're right. Phoenix is right in between California. It's right in between Las Vegas. Um, the last big show we had was WE 53, and it didn't really, it didn't really do that well. I, I feel like it, if I remember right, the arena is only like half full. So yeah. it, we're very. I've lived here forever, so I can say this, but we're a very fair weather state. If, if things are good, we're going to jump on that bandwagon really hard. If things are bang, bad, we bail really, really quickly. Um, so I don't know. I'm curious to see how this is received because I'm assuming if it does well, we'll get another one. Yes, WC 53 was like four years ago, um, the final WC show, but that was where the Coyotes play in Glendale. So yeah. this is the first time that uh, this arena will be hosting a major MMA event. And what about the fact that guys like Benson Henderson, who kind of put you know this state on the map as far as MMA is concerned, aren't fighting on this card. Ryan Bader, C.B. Dalway, none of those guys are, are on this card. You have some lower level guys, if you want to call them that, on the prelims, but the main card features no Arizona guys. Is that the right call? Um, you know, it's a surprising call. Yeah. I mean, I was very surprised to find out that none of them were headliners, just because, especially, again, taking it back to WEC 53, because that's really all we have to go off of. Benson was such a big driving force for that card. I remember that whole week he did PR left and right, going every single place he could, saying Arizona deserves this, Arizona needed this. And you're right now, there's nothing, there's nobody really hyping it up other than the undercard guys who, you know, aren't big names. Right. So let's talk about this main card. Four very interesting fights on it. Matt Mitrione versus Gabriel Gonzaga, Alistair Overeem versus Stefan Struve, Rafael Dos Anjos versus the returning Nate Diaz, and then of course, uh, Junior Dos Santos versus uh, Stipe Miocic. Of those four fights on the main card, which one interests you the most? Um, I think it's a toss-up. It's a toss-up between the Nate Diaz fight, just because he's a Diaz. Diaz is always interesting to watch. And the main event, I mean, I'm really, really curious to see how Junior looks. He's been out the longest he's ever been out in his entire career. He's been out 14 months. He's gone through all of this trouble. He's had injuries. He's changed camp. He's at Nova and Yao now. I'm really curious to see where Junior's at at this point in his career. And it's obviously a big test for Stipe. He's never fought anyone of his caliber. Do you feel like he's at Junior's level, despite the fact that we haven't seen Junior in so long? I mean, it's hard to say because you don't know what jun where, again, where Junior's at at this point. You don't know what we're getting from Junior. A, just even to start off with, what did that second fight with Kane take out of him? I mean, that was one of the most just visceral, brutal fights to watch. Just as a spectator, you felt sorry for Junior. You wanted it to end. You don't know how, you don't know how that, a fight like that affects a guy, especially considering that's the second time he's gone through a similar experience. And then you take the layoff. And this whole week, his whole thing, that his whole talking point is, he's said it several times, evol evolution, I've been evolving, I, went, I moved to evolve. I'm curious to see what this actually means. Who would have thunk that after that kind of beating, JDS would return to the octagon before Cain Velasquez? Isn't that amazing? No kidding. It's kind of depressing, to be honest, right? I mean, that was October of last year. Cain has yet to fight again, which is, you know, like I said, depressing. So how do you see this fight playing out? Because both of them... I think it's pretty safe to say wanna keep this fight on the feet. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Stylistically, it's good. It, it it's shapes up to be a fun fight. Um, I mean, they're they're similar in a way in that you're right. They both want to you know stay striking. They both want to stay on their feet. Junior is more of a, a forward pressure guy. Like he's a very linear. I'm gonna go back and forth on the center of the cage type of guy. Where Stipe is more about angles and circling. But 
it's tough because if you're Stipe, you don't want to stand with Junior Dos Santos for 25 minutes. No one wants to stand with Junior Dos Santos for 25 minutes if it's the old Junior Dos Santos. And so he, I, it's, it seems like, you know, his, he has a Division One uh, wrestling pedigree. It seems like that would be his his path to victory here. But Junior has such good defensive wrestling. It, it really, it seems like the only. Uh, the only weakness we've really seen from Junior is what Kane, King can do is really just pressure him up against the fence. Because, again, he's very linear. He can move back. If you pressure him, he'll move backwards. And even the Mark Hunt fight, like Mark Hunt, the best work he did really was when he got him up against the fence and he was really just making it a dirty fight. I don't know if Stipe is going to do that. I feel like he's going to try to stand with him, and I don't, think that's a good, I don't think that's a good exit plan. So you're picking JDS? I think I am. I am picking JDS. Does um, he the- knock him out as he's predicting? Yeah, I think he knocks him out, but I, I am incredibly interested to see where Junior is at this point in his career because, I mean, we don't know what's going on with Kane. If if Kane ends up just being continually out and continually out, there's a very good chance Junior could come in and, and fight Fabricio and get that title back, and that seemed like something we wouldn't be saying a year ago. It feels like one of those classic matchups where you have a guy you know on the rise and you know he's fighting a former champion and the guy on the rise can really get you know a very impressive notch on his belt if he beats the former champion yeah. or you have the former champion who reminds everyone after a bit of a layoff, I'm hey, yeah, I'm still here and you need to start you know talking about me and remembering me. Speaking of yeah. which, very much the same case right. in the Comey event, right? Yeah. Not quite a former champion, but Nate Diaz, very much a big player at 155. We haven't seen him in over a year. He's fighting Dos Anjos, who's been on a roll as of late. And, you know, it's amazing. We're just coming out of the, uh, the media day here. Nate Diaz, despite everything, he despite it. the, he's still the draw. I mean, he's still the guy, right? Absolutely. He owned it. He's Why a- do we love him so much? That's a, that's a really good question. Why are we so fascinated by this guy? Why he- are you so fascinated by him? I mean, can you say why you're fascinated? I don't even know why I'm fascinated. He's really true, yeah. I, Casey, our, our cameraman Casey said he could wa- watch them do their taxes, and I, I agree. I would, I would watch them do their taxes. Something about them is just so fascinating to watch, and it, it's, they're, they keep it real. And that's a silly thing to say, but sure. they keep it real. Everyone else inside of that media day is giving canned answers. You know, they recite in the same lines. Nate Diaz is holding court, speaking his mind, talking about things like, you know, why the sponsorship deal is bad, what, at the, at the, about the rankings, just about how fighters need to speak up and, and speak against the UFC. You don't hear people speaking like this. And then he, 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 cracks, he makes light of it. He's like, yeah. tomorrow I'm going to be ranked number 28 because I'm saying this. It, it's just fascinating to watch. I think I speak for everyone. We all missed him. It's always fun having a Diaz brother around. We're going to get to see another one next month when his brother Nick fights Anderson Silva. Is this the right kind of matchup for him to come back to? He wants to make a statement. He wants to tell everyone, I'm ranked number three, two, one. Dos Anjos has looked really good as of late. The only guy to ever stop Benson Henderson via strikes. Is this the right kind of guy for Nate? Unfortunately, I don't think it is. And you're right. He is the only guy to ever stop Benson Henderson. And I don't feel like we give that enough credit yeah. because Dos Santos is so quiet and he's so he just doesn't make a, a spectacle out of himself. No one's talking about the fact that he stopped Benson Henderson in the first round with strikes. Yeah. And when when, when uh, Rafael Dos Santos came into the UFC in 2008, he was primarily a grappler. He has been able to evolve his game to such a level that he stopped Benson Henderson with strikes in the first round with a flying knee, a combination that started with a flying knee. That's incredible. Yeah. That's probably the best win out of any of the lightweight contenders. And you're right, nobody's really talking about it. You know, I've been thinking about my uh, year-end awards because we'll be giving them out on the MMA Hour on Monday. And I'm having a hard time picking Jim of the Year. And, and now that we're talking about it, you know, you have Fabricio, who comes out of King's MMA and what Rafael Cordero has done with him. And if, you know, Dos Andros can do something spectacular, I mean, that team in particular Rafael Cordero deserves a lot of credit he took two jiu-jitsu guys two grapplers and has turned them into some of the best strikers in their division it's pretty amazing what do you think happens to Dos Anjos if he wins this fight does he get the title shot or do you think that he's going to get maybe screwed over by Cerrone who he beat but if Cerrone wins next month I feel like he might leapfrog him uh, you know that's an interesting question I feel like it comes down to two factors one if he if he wins impressively like if he just goes out and hits Nate Diaz with a flying knee and just yeah. knocks him out in the first round. It's really, really hard to say that guy doesn't deserve the title shot, depending on, I mean, con- considering what he's done. But then again, he just doesn't make noise for himself. And we even saw it last week, Khabib's in press conferences, raiding pre- press conferences, making sure that his voice is heard. I feel like it's either going to go to Khabib, Khabib or uh, Cerrone, even if 
yeah. uh, RDA wins. And, and Khabib Nurmagomedov, I, I, I didn't mention him, of course. I think he should be the number one contender, but he had ACL surgery over the summer. I just have a hard time believing he's going to be back in April or so. You, it, it's hard to come back in less yeah. than a year from that. That's why I didn't mention him. If he's healthy, I think he deserves it. So how do you see the fight playing out? I, I'm picking Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, I feel like at this point, you know what you're going to get when you fight Adidas. You know, he, 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 they're very meat and potatoes type of fighters. They're not going to come out and throw spinning heel kicks. They're not going to throw out anything crazy. Nate Diaz is going to come forward with volume boxing, um, pressure. He's going to throw be very heavy use of his jab. And, you know, the blueprint's out there. Just go low kicks, takedowns, just not it. And I think one thing that Rafael Senos has that's going to be really key is he's, he, he doesn't he, – he manages to stay calm within, within the octagon. Like, he's really developed a sense of calm around him. And, and with that, you can really, you know, fight off whatever Nate Diaz is doing. Like, if he's flipping him the bird or if he's talking in his ear – I feel like that's not going to really rattle Rafael Dos Anjos. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and pick Rafael Dos Anjos. You know what I like about the last two weeks for the UFC? There, there's almost like this theme, and the events are intertwined. Because last week we had the lightweight title on the line, and this week we have a very big lightweight fight in the co-main event. And also last week, I mean, you had some heavyweight fights that were important with Travis Brown, of course, uh, picking up a big win. And this card, I mean, three of the four main card fights are heavyweight fights. Of course, we don't even have to talk about the. Uh, the tough finale featuring the strawweights. There's a big strawweight fight on this card as well. But I think it's very interesting that last week we had some important heavyweight fights, and this week we have more important heavyweight fights. And that, you know, when you talk about important heavyweight fights, you got to talk about Alistair Overeem versus Stefan Struve. I gave that whole long picture yeah. uh, preface to get to Alistair Overeem versus Stefan Struve because I feel like that's a really interesting fight. Both guys are at crossroads in their careers, both Dutchmen. What interests you most about that fight? Man, every, that's just, that is, everything about that fight is very weird. Like, that it's is a big a, question mark, right? It is the strangest fight that I can remember in recent memory, just because every aspect of that fight, man, we have, like, no answers. We have, we have only questions. Is Alistair Overheem done? Is, is Stefan Struve's body able to really handle this anymore? And he, even if so, he's been out in two years. How, how, what does two nightmarish years do, do, you know, to a 25-year-old? I think he was in his mid-20s when he was out. That is the most bizarre fight that I can remember in recent memory, and, you know, it's going to be fun. What are you leaning towards? You know, 2014 is the year of the comeback, uh. so every, all signs point to Overheem being able to win, but I feel like just in keeping with the theme of the year, you know, you got the Josh Saman, you got uh, Kat Zingano, Dominic Cruz. Yeah. I'm going to pick Stefan Struve, wow. and, and, you know, hopefully he has some form of valiant recovery from a really, you know, devastating type of situation. Um, and yeah, I, the, the the rub on over him is man, he's gonna come out strong. He's gonna he's gonna be aggressive, and then you tap his chin, and he, and he goes down, and it's it's true. I mean, it's it's hard to deny it at this point. Yeah, it, it is it is a super fascinating fight, and uh, one that's very important in that division. It's amazing to think Stefan Struve is just 26 years old. Yeah. It's a guy who's been fighting since he was around 16 years old and he's had this long layoff but he's still just 26 of all the contenders at heavyweight he's one of the youngest if not the youngest so he still has a lot more work to do and we hope that he's healthy and able to you know get back to where he once was let's not forget two years ago he beats deep amy Ochich, and now he's fighting in the main event so close to a title shot one last one we'll get your thoughts on matt mitrione gabriel gonzago who do you like uh you know i'm gonna take matt mitrione uh he was we were talking to him he's pretty honest about it he said you know Gabriel Gonzaga is a gatekeeper at this point. He's kind of that entryway to the top 15. And I agree. Uh, Matt Mitrones, he's, he's towards the end of his career. I feel like he can put together a little bit of a run. I'm going to go ahead and take Matt Mitrone. Take All right, Arizona. They are finally here. The UFC in its 301st event has finally made it to Arizona. Everyone's very excited, including our own Sean Alshadi, who's just a stone's throw away from this arena. He is so excited to be here. We are excited to be here. It's UFC on Fox 13. Four fights on the main card, live and free on Big Fox. Some interesting fights. Prelims as well on Fox Sports 1. Claudia Gadelia, important fight at 115 pounds. Henry Cejudo making his long-awaited UFC debut. And how about the return of Joe Diesel Riggs, Arizona's own, also fighting on the prelims as well. As always, MMAfighting.com will have its usual fight night coverage for you, so do not go anywhere. We can't wait. Hope you'll stick around. Hope you'll join us. For Sean, I'm Ariel. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you on Saturday night.